Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear viewers at home. This year's topic at the European Forum in Albach is fundamentals. And uh, fundamental for society is security. And the fundament for international security and European security is good working multilateralism. The effective multilateralism, especially for security issues, is being questioned nowadays. Be it veto policies of the permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, the challenging leadership situation in the OSCE, the questioning of NATO's relevance by its allies, or EU fragmentation of member states. Austria has strongly linked its foreign and security policy to effective multilateralism, which is why, coming from the Austrian Ministry of Defense, these issues are important also for the future profile of the armed forces. Meanwhile, according to a recent study of the Kerber Foundation in Germany, people generally support multilateralism but 67% of the people do not know what multilateralism is, and 42% have not even heard of the term. I'm therefore pleased to maybe shed some light on the matter with a panel of high-level representatives of multilateral organizations, countries, and the armed forces. Let me introduce them, starting with Excellency Gada Fativali, Executive Director of UNODC here in Vienna. Welcome and thank you for joining us on the panel. We have Ambassador Ralf Beste, who is the German ambassador currently serving in Vienna. Um, ambassador Thomas Gremminger is with us. He is the former uh, Secretary General of the OSCE. Ivan Krastev is a well-known political scientist, intellectual and book author. And Major General Frank is joining us from the Austrian Armed Forces. He is director of the Institute for Peace, Security and Conflict Management and the former security policy director at the Austrian Ministry of Defense. Thank you for joining us here today. We are lucky to have our Minister of Defense um, Mrs. Claudia Tanna joining us from Vienna. She has been kind enough to offer a video message for us, which um, I think we're ready to see now. Ladies and gentlemen, who would doubt the importance of multilateral institutions in creating the necessary framework for global security? However, these institutions were created last century and since then, geopolitical shifts, economic changes and new political realities have complicated the efforts at trying to solve the challenges we are facing today. This has often led to failing efforts, to reach necessary agreements and eventually to doubting the ability of multilateralism to succeed. 75 years after the United Nations were founded on June 26, 1945, it seems particularly unfortunate that multilateralism is facing criticism today and it is only with United Tremf that it can be revitalized and put back on a successful track. For Austria, it is clear that global challenges can only be solved by working together. As a small neutral country, we have a natural interest in well-functioning institutions protecting international law. Today, this is not something that is just a given, but that needs to be sustained and continuously supported by all member states. When it comes to security and defense matters, the European Union is Austria's number one framework and we will continue our active role within the common security and defense policy. The United Nations and Austria share much more than our capital 
as a UN headquarters. In 1960, the Austrian armed forces began to deploy soldiers on international missions. The first being the UN operations in Congo. Since then, more than 90,000 Austrians have participated in more than 50 international UN missions and we understand the importance to keep, our, to keep up our active engagement in the future. We are not only proud home of the OSCE headquarters, but the Austrian OSCE presidency in 2017 has created a new momentum for initiatives that will continue to shape international security. Austria has always been an active believer and supporter of an effective multilateralism. After many decades of outstanding work and unmeasurable benefit to our society, we should encourage critique and doubts as they will serve as a chance to make multilateralism better and fit for the future. And maybe you will even have the chance to discuss some of these opportunities today during your panel. Allow me to send my best wishes to Alpach. Have a great and interesting session. And I believe with this, we can already start with our first round, which is going to be a more general introduction of the topic. I would like to ask each one of you to go a little bit in depth specifically what the topic means for you, what your experiences are from your respective fields of work. And I would like to start with your excellency, Mrs. Valli, please. Thank you, Laila. Um, as described um, by the Minister of Defense of Austria, uh, it is very important and it's timely to look after so many years uh, with a critical eye at multilateralism. Uh, this does not mean that multilateralism has lost relevance, but on the contrary, I think uh, the need to, to look thoroughly at the framework governing the world, at the different frameworks and how can we improve them uh, is necessary now because of the times we're in. The fact that we are here in Alpach in a new and different format, uh, a hybrid format that has been imposed on us because of COVID, um, makes us uh, realize how multilateralism is important. Um, the world is going through unprecedented challenges and most of the challenges facing the world are um, of a nature that really requires countries to work together. Uh, the whole world has become a small village. Everybody's interconnected. We're here from different parts of the world and we're all discussing and suffering from the same uh, challenges. Uh, I'm referring, of course, to COVID-19 and the fact that a very minute uh, virus has brought the world uh, uh, to uh, a standstill and has caused an economic, a social a health and a human crisis. Uh, the different challenges that we face, and let me specifically uh, mention the mandate of UNODC, um, issues of corruption, terrorism, crime prevention, organized crime, drug trafficking, all these issues are not issues that one government can deal with or one society can deal with on its own. These are topics that require a global framework and a regional framework and an agreement on a set of policies and a set of guiding principles and a coordination, and this coordination needs to improve. Uh, what we need to do now is to look at the 60 years, the 75 years of the UN, the 60 years of contributions of Austrians and peacekeeping forces and other activities that have been happening and really look at what has went wrong, what could have been done better, how can we move together uh, in a more effective and efficient way. Uh, this does not question, in my mind, the importance of multi multilateralism. On the contrary, um, I think multilateralism today is more relevant than ever, than ever before. It's very much needed. But as uh, has been described, I think, in the intro by you, when you said that very few people nowadays know what does it mean. So there is a, a, a role on us, people working in multilateralism, um, to communicate better, communicate to society, communicate to youth, and communicate to each other. Because the leaders who have put together the charter, the leaders who have come together to design the system, 
have changed. The challenges have changed. We have even more complex challenges. But the, the world today, I believe, is uh, in, in need of multilateralism more than any time before. Um, Africa alone, for instance, we have 80,000 um, uh, UN peacekeepers working there at a time where uh, the, the COVID-19 has put a lot of pressure on movement, on regular uh, armed forces, on, you know, uh, on the priorities of many countries. 80,000 uh, UN peacekeepers are in Africa. More than eight global air hubs were immediately deployed to help with uh, medical and uh, goods and, and train more than two million people on how to use uh, personal protective equipment, how to address uh, the issues of health uh, that have uh, really uh, taken the world by surprise. And in a very short time, we found a crisis everywhere uh, in the world. So. The, the, the UN continues to be, in my mind, a beacon of hope, uh, continues to be very relevant. It's different organizations, be it in the development front or in the peacekeeping, security, humanitarian front, continue to be very relevant. But we are always requested and uh, uh, we always owe it to the people of the world, the global community, to continuously question and criticize and have a critical look at the effectiveness, the efficiency, the how not the what. The what is still needed, but the how is something that we can always discuss and improve. Okay, thank you, uh, Your Excellency. Um, Ambassador Greminger, is the OSC a beacon of hope as well? Well, let me, uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, want to um, negate the challenges that uh, uh, current multilateral uh, institutions face, also those uh, operating in the security sector. That is, uh, uh, I think that that's a reality. Uh, um, and the trend that only has been reinforced uh, by uh, the COVID pandemic. At the same time, I would argue that we have fairly effective uh, mechanisms for preventing uh, a conflict. Uh, both in a structural and in an operational uh, sense. Of course, uh, I, I agree with you, uh, there is always room for improving uh, multilateral institutions. They can and uh, should modernize, they should adapt, they should be more effective, be more flexible so they, that they can react faster, respond better. Um, but I think, uh, and, and that is my main message here, um, what we can and what we must do is uh, to make much better use of existing uh, tools and instruments of international cooperation. And for this to happen, we need uh, political leaderships, we need uh, national diplomacies who understand the value uh, of multilateralism, uh, understand the available uh, tools, uh, understand the difference uh, to illustrate this point uh, between, for instance, uh, dip uh, public uh, diplomacy um, uh, uh, for advocacy purposes and confidential uh, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, tools. Um, we also need political leaderships that have the courage to tell their national constituencies uh, that uh, indeed, uh, and that's uh, also a point that I would to underscore that uh, you just made, uh, that unilateral strategies are just not enough to counter current uh, security challenges uh, uh, that we face. And uh, practically all these security challenges transcend borders, uh, um, be, it, uh, be it terrorism, be it uh, climate change, uh, uh, but also violent conflict, um, cyber uh, trafficking of all sorts. Uh, so they can only be successfully uh, um, uh, tackled by cooperative approaches, uh, um, eventually by what we call cooperative uh, security. So, in short, what we need is uh, more multilateralism. We need better multilateralism. But I don't think that we need uh, a new paradigm. I don't think that we need to revolutionize uh, multilateralism. Okay. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Ambassador Beste. 
um, from national diplomacies, national leadership that we need within already existing uh, international institutions. You represent a country that is currently holding the uh, Council Presidency of the European Union and the, a non-permanent membership in the United Nations Security Council. What can you tell us about national efforts within international multilateral organizations? Well, thank you. Maybe, maybe from a point of view from a very special nation state, which is mine, um, I can try to, to help convey the value of multilateralism to a public which is, as you quoted from the Kerber Foundation, not necessarily aware of that, what that is. I remember a conversation with the foreign editor of um, Austria's largest daily newspaper, who told me that he's not using the word multilateralism at all in his pages because nobody understands it, and he rather says international cooperation. Mm. And you could enhance that and say it's a binding, long-term, responsible cooperation, but that's what it boils down to. And I think that's what the people understand, that you're better off if you cooperate. So now we're in a world which is full of acronyms, <laughs> UNODC, OSCE, and so on, and we shouldn't be surprised if this is not necessarily as popular as we think it should be. But if we, if we look at the way that Germany has come after the Second World War, that might help us to put into perspective what the value of multilateralism is. After having lost the Second World War, Germany was banned from multilateral institutions. The United Nations were founded and we were not allowed to enter. Uh, NATO was founded and we were not allowed to enter uh, because we were the enemies. We had been the enemies and we were ex essentially the reason why all these institutions have been founded. Um, from going alone. And our lesson from the war was never alone again. So we strove hard to get into these institutions because we felt there was a value in itself not to be alone and rather deal with your partners and together. So in 49, NATO was founded without us. We entered in 55. We founded the European community together with France and other countries, um, which is the cornerstone of our multilateral um, situation we're in and which is probably the most advanced um, and, and innovative multilateral organization today, the European Union, and we're proud to be a leading member of that. Um, the um, Conference on Security uh, and Cooperation in Europe, which later evolved into the OCE, was largely founded on German efforts as well as many other countries. So we really feel we are stakeholders in this multilateral effort. And in 72, which was like the high point in our multilateral trajectory, we were finally admitted to the United Nations. This is not that long ago. Um, and we feel, um, as, as a nation state, that it helped us all along to come back into the community of nations. So it's not only about being effective and solving problems, but it's also being part of the concept of modern states in a cooperative and not in a confrontative way. And I think we should, we should always try to convey that message to our people, that multilateralism is more than about only effectiveness, it's more about legitimacy and it's about peace. Thank you, Ambassador. I think this um, very much brings us to the director of uh, an institute for peace security. So um, as a representative of the armed forces, how would you say effective multilateralism affects your organization ultimately? General, peace. So thank you very much. Uh, I would like to start by uh, emphasizing how important it is for us, from the, coming from the armed forces, to discuss security here in, at the European Forum ALPA. Even if we are here in a, uh, let's say, unique, yeah, but more or less peaceful surrounding, yeah, even in the COVID situation, uh, it is really of high importance to better communicate security with the public, with the, uh, with the, in the academia in a broader spectrum. So therefore, we are very glad to discuss uh, this issue here. And of course, in Austria, for the Austrian Armed Forces, multilateralism is an important principle because our foreign policy is so closely linked uh, to multilateralism and the military is always an instrument for the foreign policy. So therefore, if we are, it is of high interest for the future task, for the future structures and, and uh, of, of the Austrian Armed Forces in which direction the global system uh, and the European system uh, develops. 
Uh, so maybe just from the military point of view, as uh, Excellency Vali has already mentioned, it's not a question about what, but about how. Yeah? I would like in my first statement uh, to emphasize or, or to a little bit elaborate a paradoxon. Yeah? Because on the one hand, I see, uh, especially from the European perspective, a certain uh, hesitation when it comes to use military hard power within the multilateral system. So always based on this general notion that the military cannot solve crisis, yeah, which uh, uh, is of course true, yeah, because the task of the military is to provide the strategic framework for other instruments uh, than to, to tackle with uh, international crisis. But uh, we must not neglect uh, at this moment if the European Union uh, renounces military hard power, that, um, the, uh, that uh, the European Union restricts its, its political options, yeah? simply due to the fact that other actors yeah, use military hard power in order to enforce their interests. So, uh, look at Libya, look at Syria or, or other, uh, other situations. So, uh, therefore, I think uh, the, one of the most important fields to further develop uh, uh, the, the European Union especially is, of course, to, to, to tackle the weakness of its common foreign and security policy. So this is, on the one hand, uh, one element of the paradox situation, maybe a little bit from the European uh, point of view. Uh, looking at multilateralism and military more from the global uh, point of view, I see a contradictory trend. Yeah? Uh, just if you look at the numbers of uh, military missions and operations, um, uh, 10 years ago we had around 50 international missions and operations throughout all various institutions and organizations. 10 years later we have more than 60. 62 I think is the exact uh, number. So every year an additional new <laughs> mission and operation without ending one of the already ongoing missions and operations. So therefore, from my point of view, uh, I have from time to time the feeling that uh, military is used in order to replace missing political concepts or at least to, to pay some time for uh, developing uh, more consistent political solutions. And, and there's another important point of view from the military, we have to do this with ever fewer resources. Ten years ago, we had in these 50 missions around 250, 60,000 soldiers. Today, we have just 120,000 soldiers, but with ever broader mandates, yeah? and especially uh, uh, ever more uh, uh, budgetary uh, restraints as well. So, uh, this then leads for, from the military strategic perspective to a very uh, challenging situation. So, because from the strategic point of view, what we do not fear or should not fear is the enemy, but what we as military from the strategic uh, point of view fear is a mission creep. The creep between ends, uh, political objectives and the means you have available. So I would put these two strands together and argue uh, with regard to multilater multilateralism that it should be Effective, yes, and from our point of view, it's uh, mean, effective multilateralism means a smart combination of civil and hard power in a smart in a smart way, and based on a realistic assumption what military can do and cannot do, and to avoid uh, a mission creep situation between ends and means. Thank okay. you, General Ivan. If I may ask you to. Um Give us your um, unbound intellectual thoughts on, on what we've just heard. No, I'll try much more basically to broaden and to, uh, to, uh, to provoke certain things because there are two basic paradoxes in what we mean. On one level, compared to 75 years ago, the world has become a freer place and in a certain way a better place. But I do believe that if today the General Assembly of the UN should vote on the Charter on the Human Rights, we are not going to have it voted. So there is one level is the crisis of the norms and the normative base. The second thing is if we have been going to have this conversation two years ago when COVID-19 was not around and we are going to discuss what kind of crisis could help international cooperation. And we are going to face different types of crisis, wars, 
but climate change, but kind of a big uh, other natural disasters. I do believe we are going to agree that the best chance for reinvigorating international cooperation is going to be pandemic. Because this is not a war where states against states, it affects everybody. Even compared to the climate change, the level of urgency is totally different. It's based on science. So we expected that in the case of pandemic, we are going to cooperate globally. And it didn't happen. In a certain way, I do believe part of the biggest problem of the talk, forget about multilateralism as a concept, international cooperation failed at the very moment when you expected that this is going to be re-energized. Uh, World Health Organization didn't manage to do it. The United States left it. Uh, and also you have with uh, the, this vaccine nationalism that you're looking around, you see that all this that normally you believe was about cooperation became a competition. And the major thing that was challenged was that economic interdependency is reducing the risk of war. One of the important things about COVID-19 was that what till several years ago we believed is a source of security suddenly started to work as a source of insecurity. We discovered very simple things. For example, 160 of the key commercial products in the world, 70% of them are located in a single country. We are interdependent, but we are interdependent kind of very asymmetrically. Secondly, uh, uh, the McKinsey Global Institute uh, figured out that the global supply chains are becoming much more unreliable than ever before. So they calculated that almost every three and seven months, you can expect the months long break of the global supply chains. So as a result of COVID-19, I do believe we have two trends which are going to be critically important for how the world is going to look around. And I do believe it's also going to challenge, in my view, in a big way, all the institutions. One is fragmentation. Everybody basically wants to reduce their interdependence on others when it comes basically to major goods and to major supplies. 52% of the French and 54% of uh, the Germans, according to the latest uh, European Council of Foreign Relations opinion polls, declared that they're ready to pay a higher prices, but they want the basic medicines to be produced within the European Union. So fragmentation is going to be there. It will go in different directions and basically countries are going to try to cooperate, but it's going to be a different cooperation. It's not going to be on a global scale. And the other is, as a result of the COVID-19, we also see intensification of the confrontation between the two uh, biggest powers in the world, the United States and China. So you're going to have, on one level, much more geopolitical polarization, and on the other, fragmentation. And these two are going to basically balance each other. They're going to play differently, probably in a different situation. But this is, in my view, first going to put a huge pressure on the international organizations, which depends on consensus. Neither UN nor the Organization for Security and Cooperation can be better than the will of their members to cooperate. Listen, if the big powers don't want to cooperate, you can put just, you can populate them with geniuses. It's going to change nothing. And I do believe also the level of trust between the major actors is very low. And it is very low also due to the fact that most of these major uh, international actors, big states and others, they are very much threatened by instability inside. Normally, foreign policy was you are mobilizing domestic resources for having an impact outside of your borders. Now, to a great extent, you are mobilizing global resources to bring slightly more stability at home. Mm -hmm. And I do believe in this situation, it is not simply enough to tell people international uh, uh, cooperation is important. People are going to agree with this in a certain way, as my grandmother used to say, better to be rich and healthy than being sick and poor. Uh, but uh, uh, the problem is exactly what does it mean in different contexts. And this is, in my view, this is going to be the real challenge in which uh, economic interdependence now is much more viewed as a source of uh, insecurity than a source of security. And you're going to see a very different forms of international corporations, which are going to be very selective and from time to time confrontational with each other. No, but let me, I'm sorry. There is, the, I think, 
I mean, what you have said, doesn't, I don't see that what you have said contradicts what we have been saying. I think this adds to the challenge of communication or the, the key question is not whether multilateralism is good or bad or whether international cooperation is good or bad, as you have said it. Um, the question is, if I may, is to explain, if, and it's on, it's on the leaders and the political leadership in different parts of the world, the clarity and explanation of the fact that there is no conflict or contradiction between national interests and multilateralism and global collaboration. And actually, national interests should not be threatened by uh, uh, international cooperation, but uh, national interests will be protected with effective uh, international cooperation if done in a fair and just and, uh, and transparent uh, manner. So again, uh, it is the how you go about it and how you communicate it to the people, to society, to the 52% of French and the 54% of Germans, that it is in the interest, in the national interest of Germany to be part of a global community. It is in the national interest of countries in Africa to have a stronger African Union mm -hmm. and to work together and to have stronger regional uh, uh, collaboration. And I do agree with you on the fact that it might not be global, it will be regional, but then regional is also very important. A stronger EU, a stronger AU are very important for the world to, to get together and face common challenges. Thank you, Sorry. Ambassador. Perhaps just uh, two uh, quick re uh, points in response uh, to uh, Ivan's uh, remarks. I totally agree with you that COVID uh, kind of accelerate the trends that we've seen before COVID, uh, beat polarization, and this is obviously also valid, uh, you know, uh, between the, the US, the West, and the Russian Federation, which, you know, concerns the OEC, uh, distrust in, in multilateral institutions, fragmentation, etc. And, and, uh, and, and not surprisingly, in a first phase of combating COVID, we also saw a lot of unilateral lists uh, responses, isolationist uh, uh, responses, but uh, I think in the second phase we've also seen more cooperative answers. And and I think historically, I, I'm pretty sure what the EU summit uh, managed uh, to accomplish in in terms of. Uh, you know, getting this package out uh, to uh, now uh, overcome the economic, social uh, impacts of, of COVID um, sent out a strong signal. So I would argue the jury is still out what impact COVID will have on multilateralism. Is it rather this uh, negative unilateralist uh, message or is it the cooperative message Obviously, I hope uh, uh, for, for the latter. And the second point, I totally agree. Uh, at the end, it's a matter of key stakeholders having an interest in genuine dialogue. And that is very much lacking. Um, you know, the OEC is very proud to be um, a, a, a platform for inclusive dialogue. 457 participating states, um, a, a dialogue that could not even be stopped by COVID. Uh, we missed one permanent council meeting due to COVID, uh, and then we went on with online and hybrid uh, meetings. Uh, it's a platform to raise uh, relevant security issues. As of uh, last Friday, you know, we discussed uh, uh, the challenges related to Belarus. But then, uh, what we see is that uh, mostly this platform is used purely for public diplomacy purposes, for advocacy, etc. Et Hardly ever uh, states uh, dare to leave their comfort zone, uh, dare to figure out, uh, uh, you know, where is their uh, space uh, uh, to join forces to tackle a problem. Um, and this is, of course, particularly true when it comes to arms control, uh, to confidence and security building measures, uh, where, you know, we seem to be uh, pretty much stuck. And uh, despite of uh, excellent tools, nice platforms out there, uh, of course, we still uh, need uh, a commitment to use them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ambassador, well, thanks very much. I'd like to react to both your remarks and 
Um, I think politi communica political communication by the government is, is very important, but that a prerequisite for an effective communication of the value of multilateralism is that the governments uh, share that trust. <laughs> and that's not every government that does that to a full extent. So the credibility and the, uh, yes. and the dynamics of that communication is maybe lacking from country to country. And, and that adds to the point that you were making. I, I think it's nice to have this counterfactual um, view. How would this um, discussion have evolved if we had done it two years ago? It wouldn't have been easy then either. Uh, multilateralism wasn't rich and healthy two years ago either. Um, but we maybe had spoken more about the tension between multilateralism and state sovereignty. Because even then we could see that the rather carefree environment of the post-Cold War era, where we all felt we were in a constant win-win situation if we just pool our resources, our power, our sovereignty, um, was coming to a close. And the centrifugal forces where everybody felt, maybe if I go alone a bit more here and there and rather do my own stuff, had already gained a lot of speed. And to this tension between sovereignty and multilateralism, COVID added the other layer of tension between interdependency and multilateralism. And that only aggravates the view that we all have on the value of multilateralism. Mm -hmm. uh, General? Okay. Uh, just one remark to Ivan's uh, uh, statement is, uh, I think one of the reasons for the situation you have described is that uh, on the global level, yeah, we have lost the custodian of the global liberal world order. Yeah, because uh, simply due to the fact that the United States, yeah, as the country which uh, provided more or less uh, the framework for the global order, uh, decided uh, not uh, to go for the way to invest more in the system, but now to start to consume more. Now, this is my reading of uh, the notion of America first. So I think, at the, therefore, at the global level in the future, uh, uh, there, is, uh, still, there are still, still things which unite uh, the big powers. And I think the, the, big common, the biggest common interest is still to avoid a big major war between the, the global powers. I think this still unites uh, even in a great power competition situation. But below that, yeah, uh, regional uh, institutions and organizations will become more important in order uh, to tackle uh, multilateral uh, challenges, because on the regional level, you, uh, you better find those prerequisites for multilateralism, which cannot be generated by multilateralism by itself, trust, common interest, uh, common values, etc. So, okay, so maybe we will have to, uh, to, to distinguish between this, uh, what can be done on the global level, yeah? avoid major war, and then I would foresee a, a more pragmatic, interest-driven uh, cooperation depending on the, on, the, on the issue, and then a, a larger, more important role for regional organizations. I, I just want to follow, because uh, I agree very much. I'm not in a disagreement with any of you. But in my view, the situation is first domestically, something important has happened in our democratic world, and this is that many of the political parties that are in government in many places are in government because they claimed globalization is not a win-win situation. It is a zero-sum game. And from this point of view, I do believe it's going to be unrealistic to expect that this type of a crisis of international cooperation is just going to disappear in a short period of time. There are cycles. Before saying, the idea now is for many that multilateralism on the global level did not deliver what people expected. So you should have a cycle in which unilateralism is not going to deliver <laughs> for people basically to rediscover certain type of a common things. And I do believe this takes time. And from this point of view, it's quite important to see what is going to happen in this period. Uh, because uh, I do believe one of the interesting story that is going to happen is first, we have, in my view, on the level of the geopolitical realignment, situation which in its fundamental nature is very uh, close to 1989, but then we have the illusion that we knew the way the world is going, while well, we don't have this illusion anymore. So this is a kind of a major rupture. What is interesting in this rupture is that it's not simply the two biggest power, the United States and China, that are going to be the most active. This is particularly the middle powers that see the situation extremely vulnerable for them. Uh, 
So I do believe we're going to see a period of a very kind of extreme middle power type of activism in different directions. For example, you can have a middle power trying to find a networks of cooperation that works. This is the way, by the way, I'm very much reading the new position of the German government as a response to the COVID crisis compared to the response to the global financial crisis. The idea of, in a certain way to go for the mutualization of debts and certain things that if 10 years ago was a no-go for the German public opinion and for the German political elite and suddenly the idea is we should do it because consolidating the European Union is the only response that we can have to the kind of a crisis of multilateral institutions. Uh, I can see this a kind of a different type of activism on behalf of countries like Turkey or Russia, who basically try to claim certain type of spheres of influence and relevance on the regional level. You can see this type of activism in places like Japan, South Korea, Australia. I mean, all of these powers are trying to see, ask the question what it means for me. And as a result of it, it's interesting because I do believe two elements are going to come. One is this uh, geopolitical kind of tensions between the United States and uh, uh, China is going to resemble, if you look from the moon, something of the Cold War, but it's going to be very different than the Cold War because the level of economic interdependency between the China and the United States has nothing to do with uh, the Soviet-American relations where they have been living in a parallel uh, world. Uh, but now we can see that probably technology is going to play the role which ideology used to play before. Tell me which your 5G network is and I'm going to tell you where do you belong. Uh, uh, <laughs> and this is going to be a, an important issue because it means that we're going to have a major level of, uh, uh, of disruption. And also for the European Union, the interesting story is that on one level COVID-19 started with kind of return of a nationalism, borders have been closed and basically the nation states came back and ended with basically discovering the limits of nationalism of the most states. Mm -hmm. You can close the borders and then you discovered, for example, in places like Austria, how much you depend on workers who are not Austrians. Uh, and I believe this is going to be a politically extremely tense period. And it's going to be particularly tense, of course, for the international organizations. I do believe it's going to be also very much tense for the armed forces and people who are doing security because we're going to see a major trend to securitization of the economic and trade relations. Till yesterday, the idea was, I'm not interested from where you're buying your hardware. The problem is to be better and cheaper. Now the question is where I'm buying my hardware is where my political loyalty goes. And this is a new world and my feeling is that in order to understand what is the chance for the next stage of international cooperation, it's critically important to distinguish between these different trends that go at the same time. And by the way, we don't know which one is going to prevail. Yeah. Thank you, Ivan, for this. Um, actually, all of your comments. Um, I think if globally the best case scenario is pragmatic cooperation between the great powers and changing leadership within that um, sphere, then multilateralism can realistically succeed, especially on a regional level and therefore on a European level. So I want to bring in the uh, European dimension since we're at the European Forum, Abbach. Um, and I want to maybe even start with you, Ambassador. Um, what is the way forward for the European Union. Is Germany, for example, willing to take leadership? As Joseph Nye said, actually on Friday, um, he sees a potential for a German um, Franco leadership um, axis within the European Union. You hold the uh, presidency, the council presidency of the European Union right now. Is that something uh, that you think is a German effort? Well, this observation by Joseph Nye isn't necessarily original because German-French cooperation lay at the basis of uh, the European Union's very foundation. And uh, Germany and France together always saw it as their responsibility to try to lead the way as much as possible. And uh, as much as this leadership has always been appreciated and the lack of leadership um, has been criticized, if Germany and France charge ahead too fast, uh, criticism is certain too, because the European Union is not about two nations, 
but right now about 27 and we have to keep all on board. Germany has uh, feels a, a very special responsibility for the success of the European Union because maybe we profit the most from this integration, not only for the historical reasons that I mentioned that we, uh, we, we want never to be alone again, but also because we profit culturally, economically um, from our security um, uh, position. And so we invest a lot. And as Ivan mentioned, we're investing in the cohesion of uh, the European Union, especially now at the moment uh, of crisis. Um, and, uh, and yes, we feel the urge to do more. Um, the presidency is a rotating one. So we are out of that presidency by the end of the year, but that doesn't mean that we will relinquish our responsibilities in that leadership. Right now, during the half year, that we serve as presidency, we, we try to help to, to make this historic compromise work on the finances, not only on the seven-year budget, but also on the uh, recovery fund. And we hope this, uh, we see this through Parliament um, uh, this fall. And, and we're also starting initiative or supporting the initiative by the Commission to, um, to restore uh, and, and renovate our common system of um, asylum and uh, the refugee policy which has been very difficult for five years and, and we're hammer, trying to hammer out a compromise to find a new system that is working and will, um, will address all the reservations and fears of the member states. And also, I said we're 27, we are no longer 28. The uh, third big challenge ahead is the, uh, uh, how to manage our relations with Britain after the Brexit. Uh, which is very important uh, from a security, from an economic, also a cultural position. We want to keep Britain as close as possible, even if they are lamentably outside the European Union. Mm. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. Um, when it comes to partnership, there's also a partnership between the United Nations and the OSC and the European Union. So, Excellency Wally, I would like to ask you, how can the, um, the cooperation between two um, institutions can be further developed in your view? Um, I think the role that the EU has been playing and will continue to play and a role that I expect to be expanded in view of all the elements that have been there uh, and have been discussed, uh, the recent partnership between the EU and the UN is going to be an even more important uh, partnership. Um, for UNODC, for instance, we see this partnership as key uh, into our mandate. And while we are now drafting a new corporate strategy for UNODC for the next decade, 2020, 2030, we see the EU playing a very important role in terms of uh, the political role of the EU, but also the investment in development, in, uh, in security, in peace uh, is going to be very important. And the alignment of uh, strategies, the vision, the constant dialogue that needs to be there for trust building, but also uh, uh, the importance of communicating uh, to the people of the EU, to the people of the 27 states, the importance not just for small states and poorer states, uh, but for the large ones, the, the France, the Germany. Uh, it is very important that all countries uh, realize uh, that it is uh, in the benefit of all to strengthen uh, those regional uh, organizations and to strengthen the partnership between uh, uh, regional organizations and uh, multilateralism. Issues of cybersecurity, for instance, uh, if we take this as one example that is very much linked to security, but also very much linked to uh, stability, very much uh, based on uh, collaboration and cooperation. Um, our emerging, uh, is, is cybersecurity is one among many emerging threats that we see coming um, and uh, that we see will be uh, actually imposing on those even um, with more trust needed still even with uh, more uh, concerns about the economic interdependence i think this will push uh, um, both eu un other um, multilateralist other regional uh, of, of the same nature entities to to this direction of more dialogue more openness uh, and um, innovative ways of addressing uh, those challenges. So uh, I think it's going to be uh, the road that we have to, uh, to, to go through. Okay, thank you. Can I just hand over there? Well, I'm very happy to note that this uh, partnership between the EU and the OEC has uh, uh, 
uh, become closer and closer uh, over recent years uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, obviously, this is also uh, uh, a call of effective multilateralism, that multilateral institutions need to cooperate, need to avoid uh, uh, duplication, uh, etc. Uh, but I think this partnership between the OEC and EU is, is a very natural one for a, a couple of very compelling reasons. One, the EU is by far the biggest funder uh, of uh, the organization, uh, both when it comes to uh, regular and extra budgetary means. Uh, but then, and this is, I think is even more important, EU objectives are very much in line with the principles and commitments of the OEC. So it kind of makes sense uh, to, to team up, to work together and indeed uh, this uh, partnership has uh, uh, been strengthened. Uh, I signed uh, um, an exchange of letters with the Secretary General of the, uh, the Commission and the External Action Service a couple of years ago and, and this really also translates in very close programmatic cooperation in regions where we have a common interest, for instance the Western Balkans, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Also to illustrate this with an example, for instance, we are about to implement a major trial monitoring project in the Western Balkans for the EU, uh, where we you know, look at uh, high visibility uh, trials in the area of uh, grand corruption and organized crime. We do this because we have field operations in all these states. We have uh, trial monitoring expertise within ODI. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, this is all backed up uh, by the political uh, uh, power of the EU. So it really uh, makes sense uh, to team up. I think this brings a lot of synergies. The same can be said for Central Asia, where we uh, work together when it comes to countering and preventing uh, violent extremism or in border uh, management. For instance, we have a major uh, common endeavor uh, now uh, on the Turkmen Afghan border that is uh, supported by the EU. So uh, um, clearly a, a partnership uh, that uh, has been deepening uh, uh, over uh, recent years. Thank you. Um, General Frank, if I could ask you, what could be the role of a smaller member state um, in a multilateral framework generally, um, and for the European Union specifically, um, what future role do you see for the armed, Austrian armed forces uh, in the evolving EU integration process? Okay, so a broad package of questions, so I would try to bundle it a little bit, uh, uh, but start with a short reflection, what the previous speakers have said, and uh, I think uh, cooperation is really in the DNA of the European Union, yeah? and we cooperate very closely with the United Nations, with the OEC, but uh, with NATO as well. Yeah? There are uh, many ongoing uh, projects, just two examples from the Austrian point of view, we are training a uh, a lot of uh, moni uh, monitors and inspectors going to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, we, have, we are running many training programs with the United Nations. We have a specific uh, focus on women, peace, security and, and other programs. So I think really partnership and cooperation is really in the DNA uh, uh, of the EU's approach to, to security. Uh, yes, and when it comes to the, the, the role of uh, smaller uh, states within the evolving integration process, uh, I completely uh, uh, I'm completely in line that we need the German Franco engine yeah, uh, leadership, but it is not enough. It is not enough. We need other, as many other countries as possible yeah, in order to forge the necessary basis of legi legitimacy. And it's always a question of balancing efficiency with legitimacy. We have seen it uh, with this famous BESCO, this permanent structured cooperation amongst the military within the European Union, where uh, France was more on the side for uh, efficiency, so taking high bars, high standards for joining the club, whereas as I understand it, Germany was more uh, in favor of keeping as many uh, EU countries uh, on board. And this is always uh, uh, a fine line, yeah? uh, but uh, I think it's really necessary to have uh, other countries uh, on board and, 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 and be supportive for further uh, developing. And, uh, of course, then is a, the question comes up, uh, the role of Austria in this context. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, as, an, as an ordinary citizen, I would say, uh, the, it was always the ambition of, the, of, of Austria, of Austria's government, uh, since joining the European Union, to be part of the core of Europe, so to say. Yeah? We, we are part of, Schengen, of the Schengen Agreement, uh, of the Euro. And I, my feeling was every, every time when there was a new integration, uh, moment, then Austria was was part of it, and now of course the question arises: if this uh, a core of countries cooperating more closely with regard to security and defense, where should Austria position itself? Mm -hmm. Of course, this is then a political decision uh, to be made. But from the analytical perspective, uh, we can say uh, there will have to be a price to be paid. Yeah either if we want to join the club, but there will be a price to be paid if we stay outside. Yeah? So we must be real, realistic on that. And uh, I personally, from the security analytical point of view, I would say there are many good arguments that Austria uh, should be, uh, or should have at least the ambition to uh, be amongst the avant-garde or the more core group of uh, defense cooperation, especially given the fact that we are not a NATO country and we do not have the ambition in this country to become uh, such a country anytime soon. And I think it would fit with our general uh, foreign policy as well, because the general notion of Austria trying to be, be a bridge builder could be put into this context uh, very well as well. So we could keep an eye on the uh, um, uh, Central European uh, countries to keep them on board. Yeah? and of course uh, to bring the Western Balkan countries in. So this could be two, uh, two strategic uh, uh, objectives, but of course we then have to, would have to, to uh, increase our level of ambition. And I think there are three factors which uh, should determine our military contribution. It's of course uh, our, our political and economic weight. Yeah? So this, but a third element becoming more and more important is we expect solidarity from other countries when it comes to tackling with more national security challenges. And this should be another factor to be considered when we uh, determine our, uh, our contribution to the European security and defense system. But so far, I can say that Austria, from the military point of view, is by far not a free rider. We are contributing to four of the six EU uh, missions, leading one in Bosnia. Uh, we are participating in six of 47 uh, military uh, cooperation projects of the European Union, one in lead together with our central co uh, European cooperation partners. And I think these uh, days we are for the fourth time in the EU battle group uh, system. Uh, and so far, even on the uh, global level, uh, we have a long tradition of uh, 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 contributing to, uh, to peace operations and missions. Uh, this year it's uh, the 60th anniversary of our international missions and mm. uh, participation in international missions. We started 1960 in the, Co in the Congo, and since then uh, I think around 100,000 Austrian soldiers have served in uh, various international missions and operations. But uh, to be clear, uh, to, to maintain this high level of international participation, this requires the necessary resources as well. Thank you, General Ivan. Uh, I want to make uh, just two points. One is. Out of the crisis of the post-World War II and particularly post-1989 international order, European Union is the most vulnerable of all players because of the nature of the Union. Most of the others are sovereign states and it's much easier for them to adjust. So from this point of view, there is an opportunity, but we should basically be also honest enough to say that if there is a political player whose very survival, existence, and influence is radically challenged by the crisis that we see, this is the European Union. European Union either is going to make it or it's not going to make it. Because the world has changed. I'm just going to give you one example. Normally, when it comes to the digital sphere, European Union was seeing itself as the major regulator. And we said, listen, the very fact that we do not have a big companies like Google or Alibaba is allowing the European Union, being a very strong trade power, to regulate in the interest of everybody else. Exactly our weakness of not having this type of companies was our strengths. But this was on the assumptions that we are going to have a common free trade space. If you're going to have a break between the US and China-dominated digital sphere, whom exactly we're going to regulate? 
So from this point of view, on every single issue, European Union is going to face major challenges. And of course, for Germany, this was a big issue because there is one major difference between Germany and everybody else. Most of the European Union member states are trading mostly within the European Union. Germany is trading mostly with the rest of the world. 42% of all European trade with China is a German trade. So we have a kind of a others much more dependent on the regional market, while the biggest economic power within the European Union was much more global kind of a trade power. And I do believe this is, uh, it's in my view, very important uh, to recognize the type of the challenges that we are going to have. And from this point of view, cooperation, and this is important for me, cooperation is not an objective. It is not a goal. It is an instrument. Just cooperation for cooperation's sake does not make sense. We should cooperate if we're going to have a results. And part of the problem with the European Union is that for many reasons that I don't want to discuss, at certain point, cooperations for us became the objective because this is when you don't know what to do, basically you start cooperating. Uh, but not knowing cooperating for what. And as a result of it, we see on the borders of the European Union, but also within the European Union, on some of the major security issues, we are not effective. We have a will to cooperate, but there is no common European position on the Turkey-Greek conflict and what is happening in the Mediterranean. By the way, today, the moment we are speaking, it's Sunday. Uh, what I read basically in the media is that the Belarusian government is sending a major military units to the major square of Minsk, where the major demonstration is expected. This is going to be a Tiananmen coming back to Europe. This was a major difference before. You have, of course, irregularities. You have a kind of a police violence, but you never had a major military power being used against the citizens of a European state. Listen, this is a different world. And the biggest problem of the European Union is that for a long period of time, we try to pretend that all the problems that we are facing were temporal and that the world is going to come back the way it was. It was a major misinterpretation also of the effect of uh, the American presidential elections and the President Trump coming. And I do believe here the German government basically for a certain period of time was pretending as if we are seeing a kind of a phenomenon which is going to end up uh, when uh, President Trump is not going to be there. Nevertheless, of what's going to happen on the American elections, the world for the European Union has changed. And here the European Union is facing a very simple dilemma. Our we, either we are going to become effective in our trade policies, also in our security policy to a certain extent, because the assumptions of the European foreign policy that hard power does not matter, it does not matter when you don't have it. This is the major issue. When you basically cannot use a hard power, this is very much constraining your options. This is very much changing your behavior. Uh, but listen, but for Europe, it's a cultural change. Europe was what it is because we turn our back on the hard power after. <laughs> At the same time, Ivan, if I may contradict, um, I mean, very many of the problems, and I agree with you, come from the fact that according to the um, order of, uh, of the world that your grandmother so rightly adapted, is because we are rich and healthy. If we were sick and poor, we wouldn't have these problems or we would talk about them in a different way. As of now, we're still the envy of the world. The European Union as a multilateral organization is the most far advanced, civilized, rich and healthy organization in the world. We're fragile. In very many respects, I agree with that, but on a very high level, yeah. thanks to cooperation sure. and thanks to multilateralism. Not to contradict, just to, to get the proportions right. No, no, you are absolutely right. We are healthy, we are rich, and we are old. Mm, that's right. But there is this realization that has happened. <laughs> this happened, this has actually, what has happened with COVID is this realization. We are healthy, but we can lose this There's health so in a lose. minute. Yeah. Yeah. Much, we yeah. are wealthy, but we can lose this wealth very quickly mm -hmm. because we are so interconnected and interdependent mm -hmm. on the world. So healthy and wealthy can go away in a very short time. Right. And this is what has There's happened so with lose, COVID. Yeah. So there is so much to lose and it can be lost in such little time mm -hmm. and it will take us much longer to be recovered. So let's get our act together. And I think this realization has started to happen already, not just at the level of institutions and, and governance boards and leadership, but also on the street. 
what people care about is to have a better life, mm -hmm. a safer, better, happier, healthier life. So I think this is what brings humanity. This is, this is, this is common in all parts of the world. The definition of, of being rich and healthy and wealthy differs, of course. Uh, but basic, you want a family, you want to live happily, you want to enjoy health, you want to see your children grow up in a healthy and, and safe world. And I think what happened in COVID is that the wealthiest and the strongest uh, uh, nations were exposed. The fragilities of the world were exposed, exposed in a manner that we did not expect. Uh, the fragility of institutions was exposed. And I think it's a moment in history that we should use as an opportunity to build back better, to rethink our institutions, to strengthen those institutions and see what went wrong, what wasn't fair, uh, in, in power structures, how can we be more inclusive, uh, what role can women play, what role can institutions play, what role can youth play to reinvent and re-engineer those institutions. Uh, now this, is, this is very important and I'm going to give you even some uh, sociological support for this. One of the interesting results that came from this uh, survey of the European Council of Foreign Relations was that while the majority, it was in the 12 of the big EU member states covering East and West, South and North. And the interesting story was when you ask people how well your nation state deal with the COVID-19, it was different. Countries like Germany or Austria uh, or Denmark were quite happy with what happened. There are other countries, basically Spain, but also France, to be honest, where people were not particularly happy. When you ask how you are going to see the role of the European Union in this first public health part of the crisis, we're not talking, it was May, it was before the recovery fund, people were quite critical. But then comes the question, what you're learning out of this? And 70% of the people said, we need much more European cooperation. Why? What has happened was that as a result of COVID-19, the people on the street, exactly the people you're talking about, suddenly realize how much the world has changed. For example, uh, the view of the two major powers, the United States and China, has changed dramatically as a result of COVID-19. In the case of the United States, listen, People in Europe has a different relations to the US. There was admirations, there was a resentment also in certain parts. But for the first time, many Europeans felt pity for the US. We are talking about the extremely rich and powerful country, which is spending 17% of their GDP on health, which basically failed to do. Uh, to deal with uh, the pandemics in the way you expect and also decided not to play the leadership role that normally it played. You can agree or disagree with the American leadership, but it was always there. And China, all this kind of a talk that China is not interested in power, that China is just kind of in a harmonious relationship and so on, if people want to believe it, they can continue to believe it. Uh, but basically, obviously, this is not the case. It was a classical power game. People saw it and then suddenly they realized that the only options for these small and mid-sized countries, and the truth is that in the European Union there is no big countries anymore. I do believe the German president recently was quoting this famous uh, uh, quote that there are two types of countries in Europe. Those who are small and they know that they are small, and those who are small but they still don't know that they are small. Uh, uh, so from this point of view, having European Union as an effective actor on different level is the major conclusion. So I agree with you, it's opportunity. But this is an opportunity which means that European Union is going to see the world differently. Because the European Union before was very much betting on globalization and international cooperation on the global scale. You're also going to see a much more protectionist European Union in many economic terms. You're going to see the European Union very much more interested in a common strategic culture, trying basically to see and reconcile where the concerns of the East and the South go together. This is an Im incredibly difficult thing. And I do believe this is, I'm much more optimistic than it was before, because at least now everybody knows the stakes. Uh, and from this point of view, the change of mind of Germany, in my view, is critically important. Mm -hmm critically important. Uh, uh, and also the public is not going to lead this process, but the public is not going to oppose this process. Uh, and this is very important. You cannot expect the public opinion to solve these issues, but the public opinion is not going to be against it because people discovered 
this vulnerability before it was the experts. We always have been having these conversations. And people said, it's fine, exactly. I have my salary. I can always travel. I'm going to have my summer holiday. And then suddenly, the summer holiday was attacked. And because summer holiday is the only religion that basically survived in Europe, uh, you can see how fundamental the change is. Okay, thank you for this very interesting round. I want to use the next round, and we've done this um, partially already, um, to feed in some concrete examples. Um, examples that should demonstrate how we don't just have multilateralism for the sake of having it, because it was you know, invented 75 years ago, but that it does actually serve a concrete purpose. Uh, I think with um, so many crises that we are facing currently, do feel free to go from, obviously, uh, the COVID pandemic, um, terrorism, a concrete regional conflict. Um, Belarus was mentioned already, Mali. Um, feel free to use whichever um, issue you would like to discuss a little bit more in depth so that the uh, viewers at home have a more concrete idea of how effective multilateralism could be of use in concrete situations. Um, and I want to maybe start with Ambassador Gremminger this time, uh, please. Well, I, I suppose uh, uh, you are going to talk about uh, uh, supporting states in tackling transnational threats. Uh, that is also something that we do at the OEC. But uh, uh, let me focus on something that I think we do uh, uh, ex relatively exclusively in our region, and that is prevent conflict. And, and both uh, in, in operational, uh, in, in, in a structural sense, in a structural sense, uh, by uh, supporting uh, our membership in strengthening their democratic institutions, uh, their rule of law, um, their human rights institutions, uh, uh, making them more resilient uh, against uh, instability, uh, against conflict. But then, uh, obviously, uh, conflict prevention and conflict management also in a very operational sense. And here, uh, yeah, let me give you a, a couple of uh, concrete examples. Um, in 2014, uh, when uh, the crisis in and around Ukraine threatened to escalate, uh, the OEC brought in a number of tools uh, that allowed uh, to prevent further escalation. Uh, the special monitoring mission to Ukraine, uh, I think, is a key example but also the trilateral contact group that brings uh, all uh, conflict stakeholders uh, ar around uh, a common table. The special monitoring mission uh, to uh, Ukraine is a civilian operation uh, that uh, basically does two things. It monitors uh, what happens um, all over the country, but of course specifically regarding uh, the ceasefire. And so it's the eyes and the ears of the international community. It tells us, uh, is the ceasefire uh, being respected? Where is it uh, violated, etc. Right now it is being uh, widely uh, respected, which is a very positive uh, development. Um, but the mission does also uh, something else. It uh, um, facilitates local windows of silence. So it makes sure if there is a... a um, ceasefire violation, that it will not escalate. And it makes sure that uh, if there is uh, humanitarian repair work uh, to be uh, conducted, be it repairing power lines, uh, um, water, um, electricity, uh, uh, gas systems, etc., that uh, local ceasefires are being facilitated. And uh, this is absolutely key. Uh, for the welfare of millions of people on, on both sides uh, of the line of contact. So uh, this is, this is uh, uh, very concrete services, uh, both having a humanitarian and a political impact. Perhaps less uh, on, on, on people's radar is also the fact that we make sure that other protected conflicts uh, would not uh, escalate. Uh, uh, and I would refer here to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, uh, which is still, unfortunately, a hot conflict. Uh, 
Um, but thanks to the monitoring along the line of contact, uh, and thanks also to uh, all uh, these uh, uh, very regular uh, interventions. Uh, this is mostly silent diplomacy by the personal representative uh, of uh, the chair in office. Uh, uh, you know, we've been fairly successful in containing uh, the conflict. The downside is we haven't been uh, able to move to res resolving these conflicts. And this is unfortunately valid for all protracted conflicts in the OEC. And this may also create uh, a sense of frustration with the broader public. Uh, while I would argue, well, <laughs> just be happy that we manage uh, to uh, prevent escalations of these conflicts. Uh, um, there is, of course, a certain frustration that we uh, see uh, neither uh, the Donbass, nor the Transnistrian, uh, nor the Georgian, nor the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict moving uh, towards uh, 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 resolution. Uh, but again, here I would argue that this uh, is a function of the political will of the parties to the conflict, and this is out uh, of uh, the control uh, of a multilateral uh, organization uh, as such. Okay. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Excellency, can I ask you how, how you would uh, come up with an example as representative of the United Nations? Actually, the examples are many. This huge, uh, complex, multilateral machinery that is less than perfect and uh, has been able to continue to work and deliver during the very complex crisis. So I will not speak about prevention efforts, but I will speak about humanitarian support and I will speak about efforts to address issues like organized crime, the link between organized crime and terrorism, the link between organized crime, terrorism and drug trafficking, mm -hmm. and also issues of corruption and how uh, we have been working in different parts of the world amidst the crisis, before the crisis, uh, and, and throughout, and we will continue to do to address such issues. I started maybe by mentioning uh, Lebanon and how uh, immediately after the crisis in Lebanon, humanitarian support was deployed. Uh, but I will also speak about very, very close to home examples, uh, the issue of migration and human trafficking, illegal migration and what and the impact of COVID on migration and human trafficking and how uh, monitoring this and coming together uh, in a in a in regional frameworks to discuss how this is going to be managed, the legislation, the impact on the economy, the impact on people's lives, how is this going to be addressed is an area of very important work that we do. Uh, the money and the financial flows between organized crime and terrorism and monitoring that, looking at the roots uh, of drug trafficking and how those roots have been changing as a response to a lockdown and closing airports to maritime routes, the work that we do, for instance, in the Indian Ocean uh, responding to piracy, uh, the work that uh, we have all read in the newspapers about uh, the big and maybe the biggest and largest amount of drugs captured in Italy uh, of, of Tramadol, um, um, largest ever in history, but the links of the financial sources and where this come from um, originated in ISIS and in, uh, in Asia and how this is funding a terrorist group. Same with Mali, Sahel countries, and what's happening there, the very clear link uh, and the, you know, the, the, the nexus between organized crime and terrorism, uh, the work that is transnational and cross-border of nature, I think requires uh, a stronger, a more effective, a more efficient, a more committed, uh, and, and a better governed uh, multilateralism. So, uh, we're very much there, we continue to be there, and we are committed to continue to work and facilitate the work of, other, of all countries to work together uh, for no countries to be left alone, uh, for small states and big states to, uh, to work together because there's a lot of at stake. And um, I think what we need is stronger global leadership. Uh, we need those leaders who are mature, who are visionaries, who see the risk, and who can contribute to strengthening the multilateralist system. Because as uh, Ambassador Kaminger said, and, and as you have said, um, different organizations, EU, the UN, OSCE, are as strong as 
its members believe in their role and as strong as their members are willing to invest in it. Financial resources are very much needed now before than ever. Prioritization of how to place and where to place those financial resources, transparency in allocating and disbursing those financial resources. We need to put in more money behind making peace and security uh, instead of buying weapons. While I see a very strong complementarity between security, strong militaries, and making peace, and both are needed, but you really need to revisit our priorities and how we have been spending money and how uh, those organizations such as the EU are going to really align uh, their forces in terms of vision alignment, but also put the resources behind the vision. Thank you, Excellency. Ambassador. Maybe that follows up uh, on resources. Maybe two very practical, blunt and down-to-earth examples for multilateralism. Um, Ivan mentioned um, the uh, Eastern European situation with Russian meddling into internal affairs of other countries. Um, Where well, so far the um, meddling in NATO and EU members' internal affairs has been effectively stopped by NATO committing troops to the eastern border to the Baltic states. Mm -hmm. So there's American British, German troops and tanks at the border and sending a clear sign that multilateralism protects its members and, and it's been very successful so far. It is a commitment that is due to multilateral obligations and it's been very helpful I think. Another example, a bit more complex and an open story as well, is the so-called JCPOA, the deal with the nuclear deal with, uh, with Iran and that is a long story and it is based on treaties like the non-proliferation treaty that Iran had admitted to having violated and after that a process under the leadership of the five permanent security members and Germany led to a, uh, a common plan that was endorsed by the United Security Council and that effectively reduced the, um, the, uh, the nuclear capabilities of Iran and opened it up to a, to a full inspection regime. Um, this is being challenged, it's, it's under pressure, but it was a clear success of multilateral, multilateral cooperation. And due to the um, resolution of, the, of the, uh, the supporters of that system not to admit um, to violators to go unharmed. Thank you, Ambassador. General, uh, what would be a concrete example uh, for the armed forces and multilateralism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me start by thanking uh, Ms. Wari for really highlighting this close uh, interlink between security and development uh, because it's uh, so obvious but we have to state it again and again that there can be no development without security and there is no security without development and mm -hmm. so there, thank you very much for highlighting uh, this in, in, in your statement and uh, when it comes to the effectiveness of uh, international organizations. Uh, I sometimes have the feeling that we are quite fast when it comes to complaining or blaming international organization for having failed here or there. Uh, and for me, this is uh, a little bit of uh, yeah, a, a problemat problematic approach because it comes close to, for example, uh, uh, blaming the state opera in Vienna uh, when the uh, actors have made a, a bad <laughs> performance. So uh, it's always, uh, as you've mentioned, up uh, to the roles of the member states yeah, and their willingness yeah, to use uh, the, the international organizations as a platform for, for cooperation. And uh, with regard to a concrete uh, example, it's, uh, I think, quite obvious for an Austrian, yeah, uh, uh, and it's to some extent uh, expected that uh, we refer to the Western Balkans. <laughs> uh, and um, knowing all the difficulties we have there and we, we still have, are facing there, I would regard the, 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 the international cooperation with regard to the Western Balkans over the last uh, nearly 20 years or so as a success story. Yeah. Uh, and why is that the case? Because uh, uh, there are many criteria which are necessary for successful international cooperation present there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had a, a, from the beginning on a quite uh, good division of labor yeah, when it, it the first phase when it had the, the, wars had, the war had to be ended yeah, with a clear leadership role by the United uh, States, by NATO, then uh, taking over these uh, more military operations by the, by the European Union. We have now the, the only Berlin Plus uh, mission uh, between EU and NATO taking place on the, on the Western Balkans. We have so many uh, 
different roles and important uh, contributions by OECE, by the United Nations. Uh, so I, I think this is a good example. And we, we have, from my point of view, the, uh, the necessary resources. Yeah? Especially the European Union have put a lot of money. Yeah, we can discuss how effective uh, each of these uh, uh, this, projects has been. But uh, we have uh, the necessary resources. We have the necessary uh, soldiers uh, on the ground, uh, uh, civilian uh, uh, workers. So I think uh, out of many reasons, and not to forget, uh, I think we have, uh, at least here in Austria, uh, one fa additional factor which is important for an effective multilateralism. We have domestic support. Yeah, there is a, a broad public support that Austria, for example, is engaged. So I think we have many of these criteria for an effective international cooperation, effective multilateralism, multilateralism present on the Western Balkans. So I would uh, regard uh, the Western Balkans as a success story for international cooperation. But we have uh, to have uh, a long breath. We have to walk uh, until the end, uh, the road. Yeah, and of course uh, this. Uh, it should then be, from our point of view, the integration of the Western Balkan states in the European Union. Thank you, General. Ivan? So all the good examples have been given before me. <laughs> so this is going to allow me uh, to ask some questions. And you're absolutely right that you cannot blame the state opera when some of the actors uh, misperform. But it also means that state opera should not praise itself when some of the actors is doing well. Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying this because one of the biggest problems, and I'll try to address this from the point of view of the European Union, we are at the end of a certain period. And in certain periods, certain things are possible and others are not possible. Uh, what I see in the European politics these days is very much a mismatch between our rhetoric and what we can do and basically also what we are trying to do. From this point of view, Belarus is a great example of this. Listen, this is a very specific protest which has not much to do with uh, the color revolutions that people like to talk about. There is no European flags mm -hmm. in Belarus. There is no American or European NGOs being very much involved there. You have a situation of some popular leader some years ago who is staying in power for 26 years. 26 years is quite a long time being governed by a single person. And obviously, he's not allowing anybody to challenge his uh, power, so he's putting uh, in prison anybody who wants to run on the elections, and you end up with hundreds of thousand people on the street. And here the story is what everybody else can do. And I do believe this is the major issue, because if you see uh, the reaction of all players, you're going to see that they're trying to do just the opposite of what they did uh, during the Ukrainian crisis, but still we don't have, uh, in a certain way, a guarantee that we're going to have anything working. Uh, from this point of view, the first thing that the Americans did, uh, the first Deputy Secretary of State, Steve Began, was in Moscow, because he said, we were late to go to Moscow during the Ukrainian crisis and telling them, do, don't do something stupid, we're not planning to do anything stupid. The Russians, they're not an easy position, honestly speaking. They can end up in Belarus, where there is not an anti-Russian forces, the sentiment is much more Russia-friendly. It can end up like in Czechoslovakia in 1968, if you're going to see basically Lukashenko perceived as somebody who is taking in power on the strength of uh, the Russian military uh, power. Uh, but why I'm saying all this? With all these calculations, if you're going to have a military units not the police units. If you have an army going against the demonstrators, peaceful, by the way, much more peaceful than what we saw in Ukraine or what we have been seeing in other places, there was not a single accident, then we are in a different period. Because then what is doing the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe? It was based on the assumptions that army does not go against citizens in Europe. As simple as this, it's, uh, are you tolerating this? If you're not tolerating exactly what you're doing, how this is going to basically affect your relations with Russia, how easy it is going to be for the different EU member states, what's going to be effect on these people living in Belarus, who on the streets, who is going to protect them? For example, are we going to give asylum for these people? 
free visa regime. Uh, I'm saying all this because uh, this is why I do believe that the cooperation should be able to answer a very concrete questions coming of the situations that we cannot predict. Nobody can blame, basically, uh, Europeans or anybody else for what happened. To be honest, all foreign powers try to be self-constrained, including the Russians in this situation. But the problem is that there is a crisis coming and you have these expectations. And I want to end on this because something else we are going to see years ago, two or three years ago, I was in Ankara and talking to one of uh, the ministers in the Turkish government and he told me something that stayed with me. We were talking the Middle East and basically Syrian crisis. So he told me, Ivan, you should understand, World War II is over, but World War I has not finished yet. So we are not prepared uh, of what is happening in this kind of a new disorder in which the ideological confrontation of the Cold War history, but some of the imperial legacies, complexes, rivalries, and so on, are going to be back. Uh, and this kind of a world also needs a different language. And this is on why I said, I do believe finding the proper language to speak about is going to be critically important for nation states, but particularly for the international institutions. For the European Union, the value politics was only real politics that we claim that we're exercising. It was never true, but it was slightly also true in a certain way with the European enlargement and so on. Can we continue speaking like this? With the United Nations, with Organization for Security and Cooperation, where basically everybody was pretending that we're on the same normative page, even when people were not. Can we pretend that this consensus is there? Is it not going to make people extremely cynical, but also mm -hmm. outraged by seeing all this? So for me, one of the major stories is not only what mm -hmm. we're doing, but how we explain on what kind of language, how we justify our policies. Mm. OK. Um, yeah, I think a very important point. Uh, and of course, I'm uh, as worried as you are about uh, developments in, in Belarus. But I think uh, this is uh, an excellent example to also illustrate that it is important to manage expectations regarding what a multilateral body, institution, mechanism can achieve and, and what not. Now, when it comes uh, to Belarus, I would say the OEC can do two things. It can hold Belarus accountable to its principles and commitments. Uh, and I think this has been happening. So uh, if there are shortcomings in terms of uh, uh, their uh, commitments uh, regarding democratic uh, institutions, uh, processes, uh, human rights, etc., they should be criticized for it. And I think this is the case. And the second thing is uh, uh, the OEC can offer uh, uh, mediation, facilitation, uh, dialogue promotion, right? Uh, the OEC can do that publicly. This is being done. And it can be uh, done confidentially. I hope this is being done. I uh, wouldn't know. <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I think that is what is possible. But I think we cannot fix things in, in, in a given country. We cannot make peace. This is beyond uh, uh, the capacities of a multilateral institution. And, and, and on your last point, I totally agree. I mean, I wouldn't pretend that the OEC, uh, that has been conceived as a like-minded, uh, uh, value-based organization in the early 90s, today it is clearly a, a, a non like-minded organization. It's a relatively heterogeneous um, uh, organization. Um, but in a way, this is also one of its assets. And it kind of takes us back uh, to uh, the history, uh, the, the, the genesis of the, the Conference on Security and Cooperation, the Cold War, uh, you know, when uh, the organization tried to manage difficult relations. And the idea of an uh, organization that shares a common value, uh, I think, has, uh, has been lost on the way. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think for the last round, I would like to go um, through the panel, ask everyone for 
their personal conclusion. And as always with policy debates, we are uh, eager to hear some recommendations if you, if you have some. And I would like to start with Major General Frank for, for this round, please. Yeah, um, I think this was a lively debate. I learned a lot. And uh, what uh, comes up in my mind is, uh, again, the comparison. Uh, um, I would say if, that uh, Vienna would by far be a worse place without the state opera. Yeah? And the global uh, or the world would be uh, worse in a worse state without international institutions. Yeah? Besides all the, the, the problems we have, and, 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 and I especially like the, the last uh, notion of, of realism, realism and expectation management. And of course, uh, what we from the military can do, this is more on the technical level, and we are doing it, and we must improve it, so we enhance interoperability, cooperation, conference security building measures, and all those uh, things in order to make the, the, the instrument fit for the policy when it's, uh, when it's to be used. And with regard to the uh, European level, uh, I would say that uh, for a time to come, the European Union will be more or less the platform for organizing defense cooperation, for giving incentives, as we do now with the Defense Fund and uh, various, uh, several other projects, which then might lead to uh, a form of a defense uh, union, which uh, well, how uh, President von der Leyen calls it, so it would be a, a positive outlook for the European Union. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Biste. Yeah, thank you. I think um, what we have to, um, to address as the most um, important challenge as the European Union is to get a more sober outlook on the uh, possibilities and the future of the European Union. Uh, for decades, we were sure that is, it not only worked well for us, but that the European Union was a model for the world, that everybody was essentially trying to be more like us or at least as close as possible to us. And now we're seeing that this is no longer the case. And uh, this is sort of a sobering moment, um, but we have to use that opportunity to try to find out are we all on the same page when we see the upsides and the downsides of this level of very far advanced uh, international cooperation. So a certain reassessment of the values and strength of the European Union and its position in the world is probably very important for us. Mm -hmm. Thank Just you. Your strategic compass project uh, yeah, should in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency. Well, again, thank you very much for this um, uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, and um, I, I just would like to reiterate some of the very interesting ideas that were very, uh, shared today. Um, we don't all have to be like-minded to work together and work well. We can be very different and yet find a way to work together uh, and work well. Building trust is a struggle and we need to invest in it. You cannot just this is not something uh, that happens just by having the goodwill. You have to really invest in building this mm -hmm. trust and creating the space for the trust to be built. We have to be communicating to the world, to the people, to society, uh, not just what we have failed to achieve, but also what we have succeeded in achieving. Uh, maybe the world and Vienna uh, is not going to be definitely better without the state opera. But imagine Vienna without the state opera. Uh, so uh, imagine Vienna without everything that it has on the cultural scene. So we need to uh, have a positive language. And I, I would like to be um, careful here not to be misunderstood or misquoted. We need more humble uh, organizations and institutions, but we need to continue to have pride in what we have achieved so far and to have pride in our institutions with a commitment that is a serious commitment for continuously reforming them and questioning their role and being open about that. We have started a reform of the UN and for the UN reform to work, we need the internal commitment of the leadership at the UN, not just the SG, but all principles, and we need the support of member states. We need to discuss what kind of UN uh, we want. 
what do we want of the UN? And maybe mm -hmm. this is a dialogue that the Secretary General has started with UN 75, asking youth, uh, what kind of a world do you want to see? What kind of a UN do we want to see? So while what, when we need to continue to do what we're doing, we need to be more innovative, we need to be more effective and efficient. We cannot stop at that, but we have to be very open to questioning and, and uh, reforming. And here is the challenge. It's trying to fix things while working at the same time. We do not have today in the world the luxury of coming to a place like this one in a city like Alpbach and, and you know, uh, just think about what's happening in the world. Change is so fast and expectations are high. So we need to manage the expectations. Multilateralism cannot solve all the global problems, but multilateralism has definitely contributed to make the world a better place and should continue to strive for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Excellency. Ambassador, what are the managed expectations at the OSC? Well, let me come back to what I said uh, at the outset. We need more multilateralism and we need better multilateralism. And I think uh, that uh, indeed requires multilateral institutions to adapt, uh, to reform, uh, to uh, remain, become fit for purpose. But it also needs memberships, uh, participating states, member states that are ready to walk the talk, that are uh, ready uh, to uh, invest political capital uh, uh, in these organizations, um, that are ready to invest resources, yes. uh, both regular and, and extra budgetary uh, in uh, these uh, institutions. Um, and let me conclude uh, with a reference to the bridge builders in multilateral institutions, and particularly having an Austrian and a German representative present here on this panel, both countries that traditionally have been bridge builders in multilateral institutions. What I have observed lately is that they have come under pressure. Uh, in this extremely polarized uh, world. And uh, if you don't side uh, uh, with those you know, that have uh, uh, very strong views, uh, uh, you, you're being perceived as, uh, as, as not part of, of a given community. But, but I think multilateralism uh, depends on uh, a group of countries that tries to identify common ground, that tries to bring people together. In particular, if we, uh, you know, uh, discuss in non-like-minded settings, yes. and, and 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 I think the the world and, and the global challenges require that. And in that sense, uh, I would uh, encourage bridge builders, perhaps to. Uh, intensify also cooperation among themselves to withstand this pressure, pressure in, in this extremely polarized world. Mm. Thank you. Um, Ivan. I'm just going to end on the state opera because I happened uh, to, to have a friend who is a famous opera diva and I was asking why do you like to sing in Vienna? And she said because of the audience. She said, what really makes a difference is the audience. So in order to have a good performance, you need a good audience. Mm -hmm. I do believe we have reached the moment in which, uh, when we talk about foreign policy consensus in our societies, we really meant an elite consensus. Because people are not very much interested in foreign policy. If you can go and watch the European uh, football wide to basically watch European politics. I do believe we have reached the moment in which nothing of what we're going to talk about makes sense if the public is not going to understand how much mm -hmm. the thing has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is an effort which goes on the national level. It's about the national governments. Uh, but it's national and European consensus on foreign policy should be reinvented. What we want what are the limits of our influence? Mm -hmm. What are the real red lines, mm -hmm. which we don't going to allow anybody to cross and what this can cost us? Mm 
If this kind of a four questions are going to be done, then the idea of the international cooperation, in my view, is going to regain a meaning that probably has been lost in a moment in which was much easier to cooperate than it is going to be in the future. So in praise of the audience, this is what makes the Vienna State Opera so popular. Thanks, Ivan. I think with that, we're um, ready to close up the panel from managing expectations to a more sober outlook. Um, what I've taken away is that there doesn't need to be a like-minded group of member states, but it has to be member states that are invested in what is at stake. And with so much being at stake, I think from the panel there was so many ideas for what can be done in the future, but I didn't hear any serious doubt that there is definitely still need for more and better and an effective multilateralism. I hope that with this panel we were able to um, grow interest in the matter and I thank everyone who was with us um, for this session. Thank you for taking time and goodbye. <laughs>